Mark Twain Selected Works Autobiographical Dictation of December 2nd, 1907 Andrew Carnegie Theodore Roosevelt Tom Sawyer and P.T. Barnum In his talk about his recent visit by request to the President, Mr. Carnegie very, very gently criticized a couple of Mr. Roosevelt's latest insanities. One of these is his departure from his last year's requirement of a new battleship per year and his substituted policy of last week requiring four new battleships right away at a cost of $69 million. Carnegie suggested to him in a guarded and diplomatic way that this amazing warlike outburst was not altogether in harmony with Mr. Roosevelt's laboriously acquired position in the world as the dove of peace. And as the recipient of the Nobel Prize of $40,000 is the chiefest dove of peace on the planet. Mr. Carnegie also suggested in cautious diplomatic language that the warships be postponed and the 69 millions be employed in improving the waterways of the country. I said that the suggestion to drop the battleships was good advice, but that the president would not be influenced by it because dropping the battleships would interfere with his policy. Policy, not policies. Since the president has only one policy, and that is to do insanely spectacular things and get himself talked about. Mr. Carnegie toyed cautiously with that suggestion of insanity. He did not commit himself, and I didn't expect him to do it. He had no call to trade dangerous political confessions with me, and besides, he didn't need to tell me what I already knew, to wit, that there isn't an intelligent human being in America that doesn't privately believe that the president is substantially and to all effects and purposes, insane, and ought to be in an asylum. I added, without fishing for a response and not expecting one, Mr. Roosevelt is the Tom Sawyer of the political world of the 20th century, always showing off, always hunting for a chance to show off. In his frenzied imagination, the Great Republic is a vast Barnum Circus with him for a clown and the whole world for audience. He would go to Halifax for half a chance to show off, and he would go to hell for a whole one. Mr. Carnegie chuckled, half approvingly, but didn't say anything, and I wasn't expecting him to say anything. As I have said, Mr. Carnegie mentioned two incidents of his Washington visit. One of them was the one I have been talking about, the four battleships. The other was the In God We Trust. Away back yonder in the days of the Civil War, a strong effort was made to introduce the name of God into the Constitution. It failed, but a compromise was arrived at which partially satisfied the friends of the deity. God was left out of the Constitution, but was furnished a front seat on the coins of the country. After that, on one side of the coin we had an engine, or a goddess of liberty, or something of that kind, and on the other side we engraved the legend, In God We Trust. Now then, after that legend had remained there forty years or so, unchallenged and doing no harm to anybody, the president suddenly threw a fit the other day, as the popular expression goes, and ordered that remark to be removed from our coinage. Mr. Carnegie granted that the matter was not of consequence, that a coin had just exactly the same value without the legend as with it, 
and he said he had no fault to find with Mr. Roosevelt's action, but only with his expressed reasons for the act. The president had ordered the suppression of that motto because a coin carried the name of God into improper places and that this was a profanation of the holy name. Carnegie said the name of God is used to being carried into improper places everywhere and all the time and that he thought the president's reason rather weak and poor. I thought the same and said, but that is just like the president. If you will notice, he is very much in the habit of furnishing a poor reason for his acts, while there is an excellent reason staring him in the face, which he overlooks. There was good reason for removing that motto. There was indeed an unassailably good reason, in the fact that the motto stated a lie. If this nation has ever trusted in God, that time has gone by. For nearly half a century, almost its entire trust has been in the Republican Party and the dollar. Mainly the dollar. I recognize that I am only making an assertion and furnishing no proof. I'm sorry, but this is a habit of mine. Sorry also that I am not alone in it. Everybody seems to have this disease. Take an instance. The removal of the motto fetched out a clamor from the pulpit. Little groups and small conventions of clergymen gathered themselves together all over the country, and one of these little groups, consisting of 22 ministers, put up a prodigious assertion unbacked by any quoted statistics and passed it unanimously in the form of a resolution. The assertion to it, that this is a Christian country. Why, Carnegie, so is hell. Those clergymen know that inasmuch as straight is the way and narrow is the gate, and few, few are they that enter in thereat, has had the natural effect of making hell the only really prominent Christian community in any of the worlds. But we don't brag of this. And certainly it is not proper to brag and boast that America is a Christian country when we all know that certainly five-sixths of our population could not enter in at the narrow gate. Mr. Carnegie did not argue the point, and I did not expect him to do it, for he couldn't know what use I might make of unwise disclosures in case he should indulge himself in that kind of revelations.